Hey lightweights, here's what you can expect from today's episode of Mass Effect. Kidnapped me and we're about to murder me, but let's just hang out till the cruiser gets here. <gasps> no! That was the research team that turned in? Oh no. All right, so I think I had one more objective in this system. Uh, but maybe I should look and see where that was first. <laughs> Research colony, okay. Add a control first. That's Blake. Their bases are located in the Han and Dis systems. Hades Gamma Cluster have kidnapped the chairman of Parliament Subcommittee. Now I don't remember where I was. <laughs> That's back in the Citadel. Don't need to worry about that. Don't need to worry about that yet. Artemis Tau Cluster. And the Hades Gamma Cluster recently dropped out of contact. Okay, so where am I right now? <laughs> So the Hades Gamma Cluster, so I know that I had one in there. <clears throat> Alright, so let's see which one, sorry guys, this is like all over the place. Which one was the Hades Gamma Cluster that I needed? Attic and Traverse, Strenus System. Han and this. So Han could be in this cluster. I don't know. I have to look. Fanatical biotics in the Hades Gamma Cluster have kidnapped the chairman of the Parliament Subcommittee on Transhuman Studies and are holed up in a derelict freighter in the Farinata system. Take three! Okay. Antius? Farinata. Oh shoot. I don't know if I had read the other planets yet. What is this? Is that a ship or something? Okay, let's read these first. I think I read those because I'm pretty sure I read through all of them first. I don't know. Can't remember now. With a rare combination of features, Nepnu is a particular interest to the scientific community. Nepnu is a small terrestrial planet with a thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide and krypton. As with all the worlds of Farinata, its surface is scorching hot. The crust mainly consists of silicates laced with iron. I can survey it. And I got thorium. Juntalma is a small broiling terrestrial world. Its thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide and ethane is being steadily blown off by the powerful solar wind from the star Farinata. The surface is scorching hot and mainly composed of sulfur with deposits of copper. Its density is low enough to leave the world tidally locked to Farinata. The Alliance Defense Data Network notes that several ships have been spotted cruising near Juntalma with transponders turned off. While an Alliance patrol attempted pursuit of one, the unidentified vessel rabbited to FTL. Its trail was lost when it obscured its slight trace in the confusion of signals along the Anansi Ishtar shipping lane. Scans of Juntama revealed a derelict freighter in mid-stage orbital decay. Your salvage team boarded the vessel and determined it had been attacked by raiders. There was little of value still on board, but the team did find a Prothean data disk. Ooh, that one's cool looking. Tunshagan is a hydrogen helium gas giant with traces of chlorine and nitrogen in its atmosphere. It has an unusually small number of moons for a gas giant, a mere seven. Oh, is that all? <laughs> this is no doubt due to the star Farinata capturing the majority of the mass during the nebular collapse that created the system. 
All right, and MSB Ontario. The Ontario is Kowloon class module Modular conveyor of human design configured for mixed freight and passenger hauling. It is making a hard burn for the cover of an asteroid cluster. Privately owned Citadel Station. Let's board that shit. Okay, so. Let's do. Oops. Sure. <laughs> Softly quiet here. Hello? Got like too much crap on my desk right now. I couldn't see the mini-map. Okay, all the people are over there. So, are there any doors over here? No. Here goes nothing. I'm about to have a fight! Use barrier. Since I'm going in hot and heavy right now. Okay, we got two minutes left. Until what? Until what? They kill him? See how it is? You write letters and everyone ignores you. Force is the only thing people appreciate. So how about if I kill Chairman Burns and finish the charade? Please, I was trying to help you people. Let's not do anything we're all gonna regret. Why not? What have we got to lose? Since the chairman here decided that we didn't get reparations, we've got nothing left to live for. But I've changed my mind. Seeing you all, it, it, it's clear that you all deserve. You had your chance. Some L2s are nearly crippled from side effects of the implants, but you voted against reparations. Think about this. Burns is the one man who can help you. Yes, if you release me, I can take another look at the reparations request. What, we're supposed to trust you? Sure, you promise us freedom and say everything will be fine, but as soon as we surrender, you'll double-cross us. Um... This is as much as you get. What does that mean? I don't know what that top one means. I hate that. I need to know like the actual dialogue you're gonna say. I feel like just saying I'm telling the truth is not gonna sound very trustworthy. Does that make sense? And I'm kind of curious to know what she means by this. I'm not promising this. to let you go. All I'm saying is that Burns will take another look. Right, Burns? Absolutely. I had no idea that the L2 biotics were this desperate. If I'd known, the reparations will come. For whatever it's worth, I promise that. Come on, dude. Come on, dude. You're right. I don't want to die. Yes! Maybe something will happen this time. We surrender. I surrender. Thank you, Commander. I thought I was dead when they took me. I'll see to it that the reparations discussion is reopened. 
I didn't know they were so desperate. A Fifth Fleet cruiser will be by shortly to pick you and the prisoners up. They're just gonna hang out now? Okay, let's go drink some tea and have some cookies. You just kidnapped me and were about to murder me, but let's just hang out till the cruiser gets here. Like nothing happened. It's totally not awkward at all. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> and I'm gonna steal all your shit while you watch, okay? Sound good? Sure, there's nothing here. Oh, my God, this is a maze. <laughs> Get me out. <laughs> So that one is done, but let's... Message coming in. Patching it through. Thank you for dealing with the hostage situation, Commander. Chairman Burns was quite impressed by the way you resolved the situation peacefully. Your assistance above and beyond the formal duties has been noted, Commander. Fifth fleet out. Woohoo! I just want to read the rest of the planets in this... System. Before we figure out where we're gonna go next. A gecko. Start out and work our way in. Vemmel is an enormous terrestrial world of mixed rock and ice with an atmosphere of methane and ethane. Its frozen surface is mainly composed of calcium with deposits of iron. Because of noxious surface gases, explorers are warned to use extreme caution. Uranium. Hunidor is a moderately sized ice world with an extremely thin atmosphere composed of krypton and xenon. Its frozen surface is unusually smooth, suggesting widespread repaving by cryovolcanic processes, though no such activity is currently evident. Sure! <laughs> Sounds good! <laughs> Um, Paloba is the second and by far the larger of Antaeus's two gas giants. Active scans by survey ships have returned tantalizing indications of massive, solid structures deep within the atmosphere, too regular in pattern to be anything natural. Some believe Ploba is a Jupiter brain, a planet-sized supercomputer. Adherents of this theory have fruitlessly beamed signals toward the sunken megastructures, hoping to get the machine's attention. Others believe that an ancient spacefaring race disposed of their weapons of war by dumping them into the planet. The last attempt to reach the salvage Ploba's deep anomalies went tragically wrong and ended with a crew of 12 being trapped and crushed in the gas giant's lower atmosphere. No thank you! You recovered a strange object orbiting Ploba. Chief Engineer Adams and Tally tried unsuccessfully to determine its origin. They did find one of the matriarch Dalinga's Dilinaga's writing stored within. Edmos. Edmos is a standard hydrogen-helium gas giant with traces of methane in its atmosphere. If Trebin's terraforming is successful, it is expected that a helium-3 fuel refining facility for the system will be set up here. And we got hydrogen. Trebin is a modest terrestrial world with an atmosphere composed of nitrogen and argon. Its surface is mainly composed of nickel with deposits of silver. 
Chevin's environment is relatively mild, but the scarcity of water or similar enabling substances has prevented the development of any biosphere. Exogenicorp recently performed a test impact of a single water ice comet into the surface, the first step of a long-term plan to thicken the atmosphere and introduce water to the environment. A survey team is on the surface, monitoring the geological and meteorological effects of the test impact. Most of the water released is still in the form of atmospheric vapor, but thick cloud banks have formed. There is every indication that this arid world will soon see its first rain. The survey team's progress has been hampered by frequent mechanical or computer failures in their GPS satellites. Okay, so um, I'm gonna get out a notebook here and write down where this is because I do wanna land on this, but I don't wanna do it now because um, I want to check my quest log and stuff and see where I need to go before I just land willy-nilly. So I'm gonna write this down. Bear with me. Let's get a little Sharpie. Okay, so this is Trevin. I would love to know how you actually pronounce these and see how far off I am. And Trevin is in the Antaeus... Antaeus... Which is in the Hades Gamma. Um, I will land there before the end of the series, but like I said, I don't want to land there now because I might have to go back for something and there's other things that I want to do right this moment. So, okay, anyways. Um, during the initial survey of the Antius system, only a single flyby probe was spared for the small scorched world of a gecko. It revealed a planet unusually rich in heavier elements given its size. A gecko is a standard terrestrial with a thin atmosphere of krypton and xenon. Its crust is mainly composed of magnesium with deposits of cobalt and other heavy metals. Due to extremely rough, cratered terrain, starships are discouraged from landing. I'm kind of surprised I can't scan this one, considering it has rich, heavy elements. Okay, so now... Now, let's see here. I think I want to do a main mission because it's been a long time since I've done one. So I think I want to do at least one today. Um, Melveria. And Pharos. Okay. seeing if there's anything else in those same systems. Okay, so there's still something else in this cluster, so I guess let's do that first. News bids indicate that a survey team in the Hades Gamma cluster recently dropped out of contact. So this must be where I was just looking at the Trebin. Because this is Hades Gamma, right? Yeah. So maybe we do land here now. It all works out in the end. All right, we're gonna stick with... Stick with you guys for now. Okay, and map, let's see what we have to investigate here. So I'm here. Let's start, start here and we'll work our way up from there. Also, let's save. Definitely looks like it wants to rain.
Is that red line just the end of the playable zone? <gasps> no! Oh my god, this is the worst. This is the worst! encountered another Thresher Maul. Thresher Maul. I don't know what I said. Almost dead. Almost dead. Almost dead. We got this. We did it first try this time. Major improvement. Safe. I do not want to have to do that again. Can I run up this hill? There are no signs of any survivors. This pod is empty except for a small tattered flag marked with the Nimin's Colin insignia. I'm pretty sure I say that differently every time. <laughs> All right, now let's go here. Oh, that's the research base. Okay, so we'll go there last. That way we can just leave as soon as we're done with the, the objective that's here. My tires are shot. 15 Omni Gel. Pain. See what this is. What it's going to give us, at least. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Plutonium. Um, 
Oh, I'm still not where I wanted to go yet. <laughs> See an enemy up there on the minimap. Or maybe not. I swear to god there is a red triangle on the minimap. Oh maybe it's just the red border glitching out. Yeah well. Nope! I knew it! Jumps too early. Run them over. Are you all dead now? Good riddance. Oh, come on! Oh, we've got some points. Okay, let's see. Come on, Tally! Can we do it now? <laughs> Heck yeah. All right, cool. Um, I should probably do the other. <laughs> the other upgrades too. Um, Holy, that's cool. Okay, so we're gonna do this. This. And... We'll do... One more in warp. And save again, because why the hell not? Oops, uh, map. I like how it doesn't have to be my ability. It just has to be somebody on the team's ability to do things. And as long as someone on the team can do it, so can I. I'm always so scared I'm gonna be stuck. I know this thing can pretty much drive over anything, but it's still a scary thought thinking that I might not be able to get out. Oh, okay. There we go. Bye! Probably can't get out here, can I? Oh, I can't. This device is transmitting tight beam signals into geosynchronous orbit. This disrupts the survey team's GPS satellites, causing them to crash nearby. Interesting. Who would want to do that? And why? Huh. Okay. Now let's go to the research base. I'm kind of glad I did that first because I feel like I was going to have to do that regardless. So it's cool that it's done already. So hopefully when I go, I can be like, hey, listen, solved your problem. You're welcome. Go team.
Um, we're just gonna save again, just in case there's a fight here. Oops. No, get back in. So which building? Destination, research base, but there's also that. Let's just see what this is. Maybe I can't even go in here and then it's like... Problem solved. Oh, I can't go in here. Alright, well. We're gonna try anyways. I was like, this is a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> what? Husk, what are you doing here? that turned them into mindless fanatics. Whatever they found, it's long gone now. That was the research team that turned it? Oh no. Oh, that's sad. Checking for anything I can open before I continue on. I have to go through all the new equipment I get to just to see if there's anything that I like better. Okay, can I do anything with this? Nope. That's red, so I'm assuming I'm not gonna be able to go through here, but yeah, I don't think I will. Okay. Well, that sucks. I wonder if all of them turned or just some of them. I guess that'd explain why we lost signal with them, but I kind of thought it was that transmitter beacon. <laughs> That's interesting, because I definitely thought the husks were only part of the geth. So... I wonder what... Was it Prothean technology that they found that would have turned them into that? It's deserted. Yeah, we found them all already. Damn it! According to these data logs, the survey team unearthed some kind of alien technology. Could be answers at the excavation site. You already got the answer, silly. I know I have said this before, but I love how our companions actually have commentary on what we're seeing. I just think that's the coolest. And it gives you so much replayability because you can bring different people on different missions, like 
if you replayed it, you could bring different people on those missions and see what they have to say. Because I don't know if the dialogue would be different or if it would be the same. I feel like it would be different because I feel like this game is in-depth enough where each of them would have some different commentary based off of their skill set. But maybe they say the same things. Okay, so is that done then? So maybe we have to go back now? Because we definitely already know what happened to him. Huh. That's interesting. I guess let's try to go back to the excavation site now. Maybe I did this in the wrong order. I was kind of, like, glad that I came here first, but maybe the game wants you to realize that this is them by doing it the other way. Or I just missed something in here, which is entirely possible. Or maybe now that I know there's alien technology, I can interact with the alien technology. I'm just glad the husks didn't come back. Fusion containment cell. Plasma containment. Ion containment. There's nothing I can do with these. Maybe I have to go back to the ship and call it in first? Plasma. Those are just explodey things. Guess that's why, huh? Oh my god, there's more coming out the other way! Oh shit. Let's use our barriers here, and we're gonna heal. How do I... There we go. for all the Exogenus survey team. They were converted to cybernetic husks by devices similar to those used by the Geth and Eden Prime. How they came to be buried on a frontier world so far from Geth territory is a mystery. All right, cool. Well, I'm glad that was easy to figure out, at least. Perimeter clear. Which means there's a lot more to explore down here then, possibly. Anybody else wanna eat me or what? A stiletto. Um, can I just go back straight from here? No, I have to be in the... Okay. I have to at least be outside. I was looking for some of these to blow up, but when you have that many husks attacking you, it's kind of stressful to try to look around for things to... What's happening right now? That was weird. She, like, wouldn't turn and go where I wanted her to go. It's funny because I went into this thinking like, okay, I want to at least do one main mission. <coughs> since it's been a long time since I've done one. But when you're actually playing, all of these missions feel like main missions. 
like you know you know they're not because this is just you know a, a little side story but because they just add so much to the storytelling and the universe and the lore it feels it all feels so important Um, okay, so this one is in Novaria. This one is in Pharos. The Attic and Traverse. All right, we might as well finish this one because we started it. So let's see, their bases are located in the Han and Dis system. Oh, I also wanted to talk to people too, shit. There's too much to do <laughs> and not enough time to do it. All right, so we already did the disc one. Now we need to find the Han. Um, okay, so the main missions at least show up on there, which is nice. I know there's something in Artemis Tau. Focus on the Han. Focus on the Han. Oh, these are different rivers. That's cool. Message coming in from the brass at Arcturus. Hatching it through. What? Normandy. Admiral Hackett here. We're getting reports of a marked increase in geth activity in the Skillian Verge. Surveillance drones have identified geth outposts on four different planets in the Armstrong Cluster. We need someone to take them out. We have any idea what they're after? Hard to say. They may be just gathering intel on us. Or maybe they're setting up staging grounds for hit-and-run attacks on human colonies. It could be the first wave of an invasion. Let's hope not. We need someone to investigate this, Shepard. Finding Saren is still your top priority, but you've got experience fighting the Geth. You're the logical choice to take out these outposts. We're transmitting all the locations of known Geth outposts in the Armstrong Cluster to the Normandy now. Admiral Hackett out. See you again. Feels super important. <laughs> Except I'm looking for a very specific thing, so... Stay focused. Oh my god, this one's so pretty! Where are you, you stupid thing? Oh, it's Janice. We need to have something there. Ascot. Utopia. It's cool. I like how they each have a theme. Guys, I don't know where this freaking thing is. Fallon! Oh, different dino. Oh, cool. I freaking love that. I'm sure the name of each cluster has, or Commander, whatever that part is called. Urgent message from Alliance Command coming in. I'll patch it through. Shepard, this is Admiral Hackett from Alliance Command. Yes, We've Hackett, we just talked. Here, and you're the only one that can handle it. Of course I can. What do you need, Admiral? There's an Alliance training ground where we test weapons and technology and live fire simulations. One of the VIs we use to simulate enemy tactics in the drills is no longer responding to our override commands. It's gone rogue. Are you telling me this computer is thinking on its own? We're not stupid, Shepard. This is a virtual intelligence, not a true AI. It's not self-aware, and it can't access any external systems. We didn't do anything illegal here. 
Virtual intelligence support is critical to our military success. VIs process thousands of status reports and react in nanoseconds. No human can do that. We need you to fight your way through the training ground of the VI core and manually disable it. Uh, can't you disable it remotely? Our fail-safes aren't responding. Of course not. The VI operates on a closed network. It can affect any external systems, but we don't have any direct access to its processes. We could bomb it from orbit, but the damage to the facility would be catastrophic. We'd prefer to have someone shut down the core. Someone like you. I know Spectre's answered the council, but you're still human. You're still part of the Alliance military. And right now, we need you. You've needed me a lot the recently, Hackett. All the facilities, weapons, drones, and automated defenses. You're the only one that can pull this off, Shepard. Good luck. <sighs> okay. Patata na 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 na. Nailed it. Patata patata na list. Patatan list. I feel like there needs to be an extra A in there. Patat. Patatanless. Patatanless is a large rock world <laughs> with an unusually thin atmosphere of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The frigid world's crust contains extensive deposits of uranium and occasional lo loads. Ah, there's that word again! Of naturally occurring plutonium. With a total mass more than four times that of Earth. Pat should have a significantly thicker atmosphere. This unusual feature has flagged it as worthy of scientific investigation, but the need for expensive amount of radiation shielding has deterred interest. Beryllium. Cool. <clears throat> Paravin is a small, unremarkable rock world. The surface is scorching hot and mainly composed of calcium with deposits of aluminum. Paravin's low mass has left it tidally locked to the star Han. If there were any resources of value, mining stations could be established on the relatively temperate Twilight Band. Scans of Paravin revealed an unmanned station in the in geosynchronous orbit. Your salvage team found no evidence on the origins of the station, but they did find one of the matriarch Dillanaga's writings on board. A standard gas hydrogen helium gas giant Farcrothu is only distinguished by its moons. Several dozen of them have been sculpted into the likenesses of Arthro Podal alien race not yet known to council science. Radiometric dating suggests the moons were worked over half a million years ago. So they've got statue moons? That's cool. Level 2 Cold Hazard. Mavigon is a small rock and ice planet with a thin atmosphere of ammonia and methane. The surface is frozen and mainly composed of tin with deposits of potassium. The planet has a rudimentary ammonia-based life, mainly concentrated around geothermal vents deep underground. Severe storms, storm cycles are common. Due to limited visibility, navigation may be difficult. Okay, not gonna land there yet, because I wanna see what this is. Huntington Toe is a Jovian-sized gas giant with a standard hydrogen-helium atmosphere. Traces of methane give the planet its distinct cobalt blue tint. Spectral analysis indicates its extensive ring system is mostly composed of ice crystals. Huntington Toe has an exceptionally powerful magnetic field, which creates strong radio interference throughout the inner system. So that means this must be where that guy we need to kill is. Excuse me since this is the only place I can land. I always want to click A to select them. Wow, it's snowy. Syndicate Haina. All right, let's go here first. Um. Hey, Normandy, I'd like to have a word about where you dropped me. It's the worst spot. I'm thinking I'm not going to get up there.
As long as there's no Thresher Maw, Thresher Maws, I will take it. I always want to say Thresher Mall. I don't know why, but after the word Thresher, my mouth just wants to say all Mall. Ma. <laughs> I am the world's best driver. Slippery! Ugh. It's like New York in the winter. I hate it. I think we're gonna go this way and around. Do you get permanently locked out if you mess that up? I was like, it's fucking cold. Please, please keep moving. <sighs> I should probably put a new marker on, huh? that I just do. Hey, we're going with the wind. We should get a little boost of speed. What the? That's not another thresher thresher, is it? I don't wanna! <laughs> That's where the base is supposed to be. Oh boy. The game is like, honey, you've saved way too much recently. Cut it out. I thought the Thresher Ma had that little symbol too. But let's just be enemy in general. Why am I driving around it? Where is it? On top of the rock? The hell? How does one get up there? Okay, I literally drove around it, so that's great. It's gotta be up. How do you drive up? What? It's not gonna be up here. It is up here. Interesting. Get out now? Where's the door? Let me in, I'm gonna freeze. And save. It's 
kind of nice in here. You know, besides all the bad people that are going to want to kill me in a second. Where are they? Kill them all. Can I use this right now? What's this do again? Recharges all talents, okay. Increases pistol damage. Crime Lord defeated. That's both of them. No doubt Helena Blake will be overjoyed to learn that these two scum are no longer a problem. Yeah, she's more grateful that she doesn't have to worry about competition. Wetwear kit? What's that? That looks kind of yummy. So much stuff in here. Nice. Cool. Okay. Let's go. The music here makes me think like my phone ringer is on. Okay, where's the... Where's the door? <laughs> Over here. I was like, how did I get in here? I like that the doors stay open so that you know where you've already been. Alright, so let's just make sure that that is actually done. Yep. I should eliminate two of our unpleasant compatriots. The braces are... 
Okay, so meet Miss Blake in the Fortuna system for a reward. Alright, anyways. So, let's, um... It's been a long time since we've done the Codex. The Asar, the second species to join the Citadel, the Salarians are warm-blooded amphibians with a hyperactive metabolism. Salarians think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Salarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted. Unfortunately, their metabolic speed leaves them with a relatively short lifespan. Salarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. Wow. The Salarians were responsible for advancing the development of the primitive Krogan species to use as soldiers during the Rachni Wars. They were also behind the creation of the Genophage bioweapon the Turians used to quell the Krogan Rebellion several centuries later. Salarians are known for their observational capability and non-linear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage. They are constantly experimenting and inventing, and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. I'm kind of surprised we don't have a Salarian in our crew. I feel like we have every other kind of race. Roughly 12, 50,000. I don't know why that keeps blinking. We've listened to that one like three times now. The Volus are a member species of the Citadel with their own embassy, but they are also a client race of the Turians. Centuries ago, they were voluntarily absorbed into the hierarchy, effectively trading their mercantile prowess for Turian military protection. Erun, their homeworld, lies far beyond the normal life zone of its star. However, the world has a high pressure greenhouse atmosphere that traps enough heat to support an ammonia-based biochemistry. As a result, the Volus must wear pressure suits and breathers when oh. dealing with other species, as conventional nitrogen-oxygen-air mixtures are poisonous to them. And in the low-pressure atmospheres tolerable to most species, their flesh will actually split open. Oh my god. Volus culture is tribal, bartering lands and even people to gain status. This culture of exchange inclines them to economic pursuits. It was the Volus who authored the Unified Banking Act, and they continue to monitor and balance the Citadel economy. I wonder what they look like under those suits. I wish I could go to their planet to see what they look like. After Sound the suits. Geth Thresher mold. Okay, we already did all those. Faster than light drop. Larger warships are generally classified in one of four weights. Frigates are small, fast ships used for scouting and screening of larger vessels. Frigates often operate in wolf pack flotillas. Cruisers are middleweight combatants, faster than dreadnoughts and more heavily armed than frigates. Cruisers are the standard patrol unit and often lead frigate flotillas. Dreadnoughts are kilometer long capital ships mounting heavy long range firepower. They are only deployed for the most vital missions. Carriers are dreadnought sized vessels that also carry large numbers of fighters. Smaller vessels are almost exclusively used in a support role to the warships during combat. Fighters are one-man craft used to perform close-range attacks on enemy ships. Interceptors are one-man craft optimized for destroying opposing fighters. Hmm. I will not remember that at all, but that's the good to Normandy know. The Normandy is a prototype starship <laughs> developed by the Human Systems Alliance with the assistance of the Citadel Council. It is optimized for scouting and reconnaissance missions in unstable regions using state-of-the-art stealth technology. For most ships, the heat generated through standard operations is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, is able to temporarily sink this heat within the hull. Combined with refrigeration of the exterior hull, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. This is not without risk. The stored heat must eventually be radiated or it will build to levels capable of cooking the crew alive. Another component of the stealth system is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus drive, a mass effect core twice the standard size. The Tantalus drive generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat emitting thrusters. 
That hurts my brain. Ship mobility dominates space combat. The primary objective is to align the mass accelerator along the bow with the opposing vessel's broadside. Battles typically play out as artillery duels, fought at ranges measured in thousands of kilometers. Though assaults through defended mass relays often occur at knife fight ranges, as close as a few dozen kilometers. Most ship-to-ship -ship engagements are skirmishes between patrol vessels of cruiser weight and below, with dreadnoughts and carriers only deployed in full-scale fleet actions. Battles in open space are short and often inconclusive, as the weaker opponent typically disengages. Once a ship enters FTL flight, the combat is effectively over. There are no sensors capable of tracking them or weapons capable of damaging them. The only way to guarantee an enemy will stand and fight is to attack a location they have a vested interest in, such as a settled world or a strategically important mass relay. Space combat sounds terrifying to me. Cause, like, okay, so water combat, if we're thinking like old days with like a pirate ship or whatever, your ship sinks. You could in theory jump off it and swim away. But your ship in space explodes, you're toast. Bye bye, adios. Biotics Floating is forever. The of An artificial intelligence is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision making. Creation of a conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow, expensive education, and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, an AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality as variations in the quantum hardware and runtime results create unpredictable variations. The Geth serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI, and in Citadel space, they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living, conscious entity, deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically correct alternative. I mean, it's kind of true because if it has its own intelligence and it can think on its own, I feel like it needs to be treated as its own life form, even though it's not a life like the typical standard definition that we think of. If it can think on its own, that means it can, in theory, start to feel on its own. Um, and that just uh, AI is fascinating but terrifying because I don't know. But I agree. I feel like it it should they should have rights because if they can a think on their own, then they should have rights to do that. Increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space time when subjected to an electrical current. With a positive current, mass is increased. With a negative current, mass is decreased. The stronger the current, the greater the magnitude of the dark energy mass effect. In space, low mass fields allow FTL travel and inexpensive surface to orbit transit. High mass fields create artificial gravity and push space debris away from vessels. In manufacturing, low mass fields permit the creation of evenly blended alloys, while high mass compaction creates dense, sturdy construction materials. The military makes extensive use of mobility-enhancing technologies, with mass effect utilizing fighting vehicles standard frontline issue in most military forces. Mass effect fields are also essential in the creation of kinetic barriers or shields to protect against enemy fire. That went way over my head, not gonna Omni lie. Omni tools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and mini factoring fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omni tool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor, from a distance. The fabrication module can rapidly assemble small three-dimensional objects from common reusable industrial plastics, ceramics, and light alloys. This allows for field repairs and modifications to most standard items, as well as the reuse of salvaged equipment. 
Omni tools are standard issue for soldiers and first in colonists. Oh, so when we like, when we heal or do our upgrades or things like that, we're not actually like keeping all of that on our person. It's the Omni tool that's essentially like creating it on the fly for us because we took it in at one point. Is that what that means? That's kind of cool. Combat heart. Medigel is a common medicinal salve used by paramedics, EMTs, and military personnel. It combines several useful applications, a local anesthetic, disinfectant, and clotting agent all in one. Once applied, the gel is designed to grip tight to flesh until subjected to a frequency of ultrasound. It is sealable against liquids, most notably blood, as well as contaminants and gases. The gel is a genetically engineered bioplasm created by the CERTA Foundation, a medical technology megacorp based on Earth. Technically, Medigel violates council laws against genetic engineering, but to date, it has proved far too useful to ban. Interesting. I kind of just pictured Medigel to be like liquid Band-Aid. <laughs> Like, oh, I'm hurt, let's just put some liquid Band-Aid on. But it's actually genetically engineering and changing your... Uh, uh, I feel like the long-term effects of that could be pretty bad. Um, okay. The Asari came late to the concept of world government. For centuries, their homeworld of Thessia was dotted with loose confederacies of great republican cities. The closest earthly equivalent would be the ancient Mediterranean city-states. Since the Asari culture values consensus and accommodation, there was little impetus for larger principalities. Rather than hoard resources, the Asari bartered freely. Rather than attack one another over differing philosophies, they sought to understand one another. Only in the information age did the city-states grow close. Communication over internet evolved into an electronic democracy. Asari have no politicians or elections, but a freewheeling, all-inclusive legislature that citizens can participate in at will. Policy debates take place at all hours of the day in official chat rooms and forums moderated by specially programmed virtual intelligences. All aspects of policy are open to plebiscite at any time. Uh, in any given debate, the Asari tend to lend the most credence to the opinions of any matriarchs present, nearly always deferring to the experience of these millennia-old wise women. Achieving consensus through public debate may take too long in a crisis. In cases where prompt, decisive action is required, the Asari defer to the wisdom of the local matriarchs. Huh. Before they joined the Citadel Council, the Salarians' most potent military tool was a small reconnaissance team known as the League of One. Their primary training was in espionage and assassination. Never more than a dozen strong, the team was adept at infiltrating the tightest defenses and eliminating all necessary obstacles. Only a few top members of government and military were privy to the League's identities. League members were, wore no distinguishing garments and held no particular rank. The only evidence of their participation in the League was a small medallion presented to each member upon induction. This secrecy was maintained until the formation of the Council. So that's what we're finding when we are collecting medallions, that's what those are. In an effort to dispel rumors and appease their new Asari partners, the Salarian Union released all classified documents pertaining to the League. The League of One was suddenly exposed and in danger of being hunted by enemies of the Salarians. Before any harm could be done, the team mysteriously disappeared. Most assumed this was a convenient lie to help hide their identities, but a few months later, the inner cabinet was murdered. Though there was no incriminating evidence, it was clear who was responsible. Realizing the threat posed by this rogue outfit, the Special Tasks Group dispatched a team of hunters. When they didn't return, the STG dispatched ten of its brightest operators with broad discretionary powers. Only two returned. They reported no evidence of the League. No further incidents were reported, and it was assumed the League was wiped out. Some recently declassified documents, however, have suggested there may have been a 13th member who eluded the Solarian army. Um, okay. The problem is when I read out loud, I'm not comprehending. I'm literally just reading. So then I have to like actually go back and reread it in my head real quick. So the team mysteriously disappeared. The inner cabinet was murdered. So is the inner cabinet from the Salarians? Hmm. 
So is the inner cabinet a Salarian group? Like they're their government? And they were the ones who released the documents that kind of blew the STG out? And then the STG wiped them out in retaliation to that? This way, all the evidence confirming the existence of the Protheans, little is known about their culture and society. From time to time, dig sites will yield new clues, but after 50,000 years of decay, little of value is unearthed. Recent research has focused on the discovery of Prothean data disks. On their own, they are frail and rarely found in one piece. Occasionally, however, an intact disk will be discovered within a console or reading device. To date, over three dozen disks have been recovered, and a few of those have been restored to the point where researchers can analyze them. Though it may be some time before scientists discover a way to transfer the data off the disks, they are currently considered the most tangible leads for learning about the Prothean culture. And we are collecting those as well. Cool. The Genophage bioweapon was created to end the Krogan rebellions. From the start, the Krogan had overwhelmed the Council. Only timely first contact with the Turians saved the Council races. The Turians fought the Krogan to a standstill, but sheer weight of Krogan numbers indicated the war would not be won through conventional means. The Turians collaborated with the Salarians to genetically engineer a counter to the rapid breeding of the Krogan. The Genophage virus gained the energy to replicate by eating key genetic sequences. Every cell in every Krogan had to be altered for the weapon to be foolproof. Otherwise, the Krogan could have used gene therapy to fix the affected tissues. Once a genophage strain could find no more genes to eat, it would starve and die, limiting spin-off mutation and contamination. This created genetic flaw is hereditary. The Salarians believed the genophage would be used as a deterrent, a position the Turians viewed as naive. Once a project was complete, the Turians mass-produced and deployed it. The Krogan homeworlds, their colonies, and all occupied worlds were infected. So the Salarians kind of thought that the Turians would hold it over the Krogan's head and be like, stop fighting or else. And the Turians are like, fuck that, and just deployed it. That sucks. The resulting mutation made only one in a thousand Krogan pregnancies carry to term. It did not reduce fertility, but offspring viability. The rare females able to carry children to term became prizes the Krogan warlords fought brutal battles over. The Krogan are a shadow of their former glory. While their rebellions took place centuries ago, they constantly reminded of the horror of the genophage and of their inability to counter it. The release of the genophage is still controversial, bitterly debated in many circles. Sorry, they... They hit a little too home. Too close to home. <clears throat> um, for those of you new here, before I had baby light, I got pregnant a few times and wasn't able to, um... Wasn't able to hold on to the pregnancy, so... That was <laughs> way too close to home. <clears throat> After the Rachni War, the quick breeding Krogan expanded at the expense of their neighbors. Warlords leveraged their veteran soldiers to seize living space while the council races were still grateful. Over centuries, the Krogan conquered world after world. There was always just one more needed. When the council finally demanded withdrawal from the Asari colony of Lucia, Krogan overlord Kredak stormed off the citadel, daring the council to take their worlds back. But the council had taken precautions. The finest STG operators and Asari huntresses had been drafted into a covert observation force, the Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance. The Spectres opened the war with crippling strategic strikes. Krogan planets went dark as computer viruses flooded the extranet. Sabotaged antimatter refineries disappeared in blue-white annihilation. Headquarters stations shattered into orbit-clogging debris, ran by pre-placed suicide freighters. Still, the only delay Still, this only delayed the inevitable. The war would have been lost if not for first contact with the Turians, who responded to Krogan threats with a prompt declaration of war. Being on the far side of Krogan's space from the Council, the Turians advanced rapidly into the lightly defended Krogan rear areas. The Krogan responded by dropping space stations and asteroids on the Turian colonies. Three worlds were rendered completely uninhabitable. This was precisely the wrong approach to take with the Turians. Each is first and foremost a public servant, willing to risk his life to protect his comrades. Rather than increasing public war wariness, Krogan tactics stiffened Turian resolve. 
The arrival of Turian task forces saved many worlds from the warlord's marauding fleets, but it took development of the Genophage weapon to end the war. There were decades of unrest afterwards. Rogue warlords and holdout groups of insurgents refused to surrender or disappeared into the frontier systems to become pirates. The Migrant Fleet has little economic base, operating in a state of perpetual hand-to-mouth. While Quarian ships include light manufacturing and assembly plants, they lack heavy industry, such as refining and shipbuilding. The fleet has tankers for water purification and oxygen cracking, but the space-intensive nature of agriculture limits food production. A single disaster could destroy the fragile balance. The Quarians earn income in creative ways. Because the government is obliged to provide food, water, air, and medical support for every individual, the Conclave strategically determines the course of the fleet to bring in resources and income. A species who suspects the migrant fleet is heading towards their space offers a gift of surplus starships, fuel, and resources to convince the Conclave to alter course. As the fleet passes through a system, swarms of mining vessels work over asteroids for metals and silica materials and cometary bodies for water, ice, and organics. Quarian miners are adept at locating and strip mining space-borne resources. This sparks conflict with corporations already working the systems. Large mining concerns spend millions on lobbyists and public relations portraying the Quarians as locusts, devouring the resources of a system before moving on. Kind of sounds like it. The greatest asset of the Quarians is their rarefied skills. Most are experienced miners. Due to their life of perpetual salvage and repair, they are skilled engineers and technicians. More than once, the very corporations that lobby against the Quarians have made backroom deals with the fleet, arranging for skilled Quarians to fill space engineering jobs that other species would demand higher wages for. Quarians are widely hated among the working classes. The Quarians are coming to take our jobs is a common response to the fleet's approach. Seems like the go-to no matter the time period. They're stealing our jobs! Due to the Quarian's precious existence and the need to enforce strict rationing, government is somewhat autocratic. The migrant fleet's operations are directed by the Admiralty, a board of five military officers who are advised by a legislative body called the Conclave. Each vessel in the fleet has the right to send representatives to the Conclave aboard the flagship. The number of representatives is based on crew size. Larger clans with bigger ships and more votes form the cores of political blocks. Opposition comes from the Outriders Coalition with delegates from thousands of smaller ships. The Admiralty defers to the Conclave's decisions in most circumstances. However, if all five members agree that a Conclave decision jeopardizes their survival of the fleet and cannot get the Conclave to address their concerns, they have the right to summarily overturn the legislative decision. So they do have some systems of check and balances there. After the Admiralty uses the extraordinary power, they must resign. If the Admiralty does not step down after using their veto, the rest of the military is obliged to arrest them. Each ship captain has authority over his vessel, but is advised by an elected civilian council, just as the Admiralty is advised by the Conclave. This relationship may range from cooperative to polite tolerance to outright hostility, but any captain who overrules his council without good reason is relieved of command by the Admiralty. Many Corian ships are owned by clans who pool their resources to purchase used vessels from private sellers. Large ships are prestigious for big, rich clans, but a small ship means status for small clan with enough personal wealth to afford a private vessel. Clan vessel captains are not subject to dismissal by the Admiralty. Abusive captains are a family problem if they do not disrupt the operations of the fleet. So it seems like there's a system of checks and balances, and part of that almost reminded me of our system here in the United States with like state size determining how many um, elected officials you have. Interesting. The migrant fleet is the largest concentration of starfaring vessels in the galaxy, sprawling across millions of kilometers. It could take days for the entire fleet to pass through a mass relay. When the Quarians fled their home world, the fleet was a motley aggregation of freighters, shuttles, industrial vessels, and the odd warship. After three centuries, all have been modified to support larger crews as comfortably as possible. As the Quarians achieved stability, they began weeding out the ships least suitable for long-term habitation, selling them and pooling the money to buy larger and more space-worthy hulls. This process is ongoing as vessels wear out and break down. While some ships enjoy dedicated cabins with full privacy and sanitary facilities, many more are former freighters whose cargo bays and containers are pressurized and divided into family spaces using simple metal cubicle bulkheads. The Quarians enliven these austere spaces with colorful quilts and tapestries, which also help muffle sound. That sounds horrible. That sounds horrible. 
The day-to-day -day operations of the fleet, traffic control, station keeping, supply distribution, and so on, are under military jurisdiction. Though ship captains have the authority to deviate from their assigned positions and may leave the fleet at any time, they are assumed to do so at their own risk. As the migrant fleet moves around the galaxy, many ships split off to pursue individual goals, returning days or years later. Okay. Um... I'm gonna read this last one and then I'm gonna stop there because we're already at an hour and a half. The ring is an enclosed loop of park-like space serving as the connection point for the wards. The interior walls are lined with embassies of influential species and private residences for the galaxy's elite. The Presidium is full of open air restaurants, bars, and luxurious meeting areas. Gravity is about one third Earth normal. A holographic sky is projected over the ceiling of the ring. Unlike the 24 seven bustle of the wards, the Presidium maintains a 20 hour day cycle day schedule with a six hour night where lights are dimmed and the sky goes through a night cycle. Oh, that's so cool. Offices and residences are often open to the interior. It is not unusual for embassies to have no exterior wall at all. This does not cause a crime problem due to the heavy CSEC presence in ubiquitous monitoring devices on the Presidium. These are quickly identified and apprehended. The ring is the location of the Citadel's spaceports. Being closer to the center of spin, there is less motion for a ship to match, and the reduced spin gravity makes handling cargo easier. Hundreds of ships pass through the Citadel every day, and every species with an embassy is granted a private dock. The tower, at the center of the ring, holds the administration of the Citadel Council. The tower rises over a kilometer from the ring, appearing to thrust forward parallel to the ward arms. As the tower is at the center of the spin axis, it experiences little centrifugal force. Gravity is maintained using mass effect fields at a 90 degree angle to the ring and wards. A consular dock can be found at the base of the tower. While normally used for diplomatic couriers and specter business, the shuttles docked here can evacuate the council government in an emergency. There goes Ralphie barking. All right, guys, um, I'm going to stop there. Um, sorry, Ralphie's barking. There's somebody standing on my front door. I don't know who they are, so I'm not answering it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to work through that, though. Um, hopefully they leave soon and Ralphie stops barking. I'm also recording this just in case it's a creeper. I hate when people come to my door and I don't know who they are. Like, why are you at my door? Go away. <laughs> Anyways, um, so interesting about the husks. Is the Geth technology the same as other technology, like older technology? I don't know. Was that technology Geth technology that they uncovered? I have no idea, but it's interesting nonetheless. Oh my God, that person's not leaving. Why are they not leaving? Why are they not leaving? Guys, I hate this so much. I hate this so much. Go away. I want to peek out the window again, but I don't want them to see me looking. <laughs> Why am I whispering? Anyways, um... And I, like always, like I said earlier, I feel like the side missions, you just learn so much, they don't feel like side missions. So I have not done a main mission and I don't even know how long this playthrough is going to last the entire lifespan of the channel, I think, at this rate. But um, I'm learning a lot and I'm having fun. <laughs> I hope you are too. <laughs> if you are, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell button when you do so that you know when I post future videos. Sorry I didn't give much thought breakdown. I'm like really anxious that there's somebody hanging out outside my house. So I'm going to go deal with that, I think. But thank you for watching. I hope you have an amazing day. <laughs>